Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our fourth Lenten lecture tonight. And uh, we're very privileged to have a talk from our wonderful new priest, uh, a man who needs no introduction. Uh, but as you know, he's considered probably <laughs> the greatest grace to my life at the moment, uh, the greatest gift to our parish. Uh, so um, I'm, we're really blessed to have him speak tonight on a, a topic that I really wish all Catholics knew more about, and that is the Eucharist. The title of Father Ronnie's talk is Claire and Carlo, Saints of the Eucharist. I remember reading uh, not that long ago about um, a survey done of the average mass-going American Catholic about what they believed about the Eucharist. And only about 28% of mass-going Catholics actually knew what Catholics believe about the Eucharist. So it's no surprise then, particularly in the post-pandemic era, uh, that uh, we're seeing the, uh, the, there's not the, the, the rush of people coming back to mass. Because unless you know what the Eucharist is, you, you will never fall in love with it in the way we should. So tonight, I'm sure Father Ronnie will give us a much deeper, more beautiful, more hope-filled understanding of the Eucharist. And it's my prayer that we will go away trying to encourage others um, to deepen their knowledge and appreciation of this wondrous sacrament. So thank you very much, Father Ronnie. We might uh, just say a little prayer together. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the grace of this evening. And most of all, dear Lord, we thank you for the gift of your Son. Your Son who dies on the cross. Your Son who dies for our sins. And your Son who feeds us with the great grace and the great gift that is the Eucharist, the gift of his body, blood, soul and divinity. As we contemplate this mystery tonight, Lord, help us to grow in greater fervour, greater love, greater devotion, greater reverence, to this most wondrous sacrament. And we pray especially, Lord, for those many Catholics who do not know the truth of this wondrous gift. May our reverence, our piety, our example, and our witness to the gospel be a vehicle with which others may come to know your Son through the Eucharist. We ask Mary, our mother, as always, to pray with us and for us as we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now, the hour of our death. Amen. <coughs> our Lady, our hope, seed of wisdom. Saint Catherine Labore. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Father Ronnie, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Father Greg. Father Greg asked me to give this talk before I got here to the parish. He got me working even before I was here. So in return, I've got him working tonight. We can't find the clicker for the PowerPoint, so he's going to be hitting the slides. So thank you, Assistant Father Greg. So Father, if you can click the first one, that'd be great. off to a good start <laughs> just just hit the arrow on the keyboard <laughs> there we go there we go <laughs> father Greg's doing well <laughs> so in the 1950s the world was experiencing an explosion of all sorts of inventions and the, one of the biggest explosions was the invention of the TV and this very new advanced technology was beginning to make its way into living rooms all over the world, as you can see in the photo, the very advanced technology, how things have changed. Pope Pius XII was the Pope at the time of the invention of the TV. And the Holy Father was actually a very technologically minded sort of guy. He, one of his hobbies in this time of great inventions was to keep up with all of these different sorts of new things coming out. He loved to research them. He loved to hear about them, how they were developed and what they were being used for. So he used to follow with a very keen interest all these intentions. And the TV was massive. The invention of the TV was massive. It was quickly becoming universally common. And very wisely, the Holy Father 
seeing how powerful, how world-changing and how influential the TV was going to be, he knew it needed a patron saint to guide its implementation and its use. And the Holy Father wrote, he said, this wonderful instrument, as everyone knows, and we said clearly ourselves, can be the source of very great wealth, but also of very deep troubles. And so the saint he chose to guide the invention and the use of the TV was Saint Clare of Assisi. A pretty unusual decision <laughs> on the surface. Saint Clare was poor, having no possessions of herself. If she lived to, in the 50s, she would have had no money whatsoever to be able to buy a TV. She lived 800 years before the invention of the TV, having absolutely no concept of it at all and how something like it could be possible. But the Holy Father chose St. Clair to be its patron saint. Why? One Christmas Eve, towards the end of St. Clair's life, she became incredibly ill. And she was stuck in her bed in the convent and midnight was approaching and all the sisters began to make their way to the chapel for midnight mass. And she could hear the commotion from her room. She could hear all the sisters hurling through the corridors and making their way to mass. And she desired so deeply from where she was to be with them. She desired so deeply to go to mass. It was just impossible. And she notes in her diary, she said a little prayer. She said, see, Lord, as all the sisters went off and it went all quiet, she said, see, Lord, I am left here alone. And she was overcome, absolutely overcome with emotion that on this great feast at midnight mass on Christmas, that she'd miss out on mass. And seeing how overcome she was with emotion, how disappointed she was, the Holy Spirit came to her rescue and projected the images and the sounds of Mass onto the wall of her bedroom. Father Greg, if we click two along, I miss, there's the Pope. And there's one artist's impression of that event. St. Clair was the first attendee of a live streamed Mass. And it wasn't TV or technology or YouTube or anything like that. It was all the work of the Holy Spirit projecting the Mass. And Claire shared and participated as best she could from her room in the Mass going on in the chapel, praying with the sisters and being with them and singing and joining in all the prayers. And that's why the Holy Father chose her as the patron saint of TV. It's often said that in a moment of crisis and trouble, problems aren't usually created, but rather the true state of things, the true state of people and relationships come to light. The pressure and the circumstances of a crisis allow the facade to fade away and people are brought to a moment of honesty. Crisis brings honesty. There's no time, there's no energy to fuss about anything other than the core issue. People are confronted and cannot be distracted. The crisis at this time in Claire's life, incredibly ill, unable to attend mass, unable to be where she so wanted to be, serves this very purpose in her life. We see in the moment of crisis, in the moment of trouble and suffering for her, the true state of her soul come to the surface and it's seen so clearly. We see a soul filled with a deep desire to be united to Christ through the Eucharist. There's a deep sadness in her missing out and a deep yearning in her heart. And we can ask ourselves, why did the Holy Spirit grant her this particular grace? Why did he allow her to do that? 
Was it for her convenience? Was it for just to try something new and worship in a different way? The Holy Spirit granted her that grace because Claire knew so plainly that she would find no more real, no more intimate, no more complete encounter and union with Jesus than in the encounter and union she got to experience each and every single time she went to Holy Communion. That was in her heart. Father Greg, if we click the next slide, please. Claire's faith and in the presence and power of Jesus in the Eucharist ran through all her life. This is the more familiar image of St. Claire holding up the Eucharist in a monstrance. The one on the left is a little more ornate and a little bit different. The one on the right, the more traditional that we perhaps are used to. Her faith in Christ's presence and power in the Eucharist wasn't just in that moment of crisis, but all through her life. And the story behind this image presents that to us as well. It was one of the most critical stages of her convent and her sisters and the whole town of Assisi. The town was under imminent attack from Muslim Saracens invading, coming to take over their town. And really there was little hope for any sort of victory. Everyone was in a panic. Everyone was in despair. And as the soldiers were approaching the town and the convent, which was really at the forefront of the town and would have been taken first, Claire ordered for the Blessed Sacrament to be taken out to the city walls and placed there. And there, whilst it was on the city walls, Claire prostrated herself before the Eucharist and entrusted the whole situation to Jesus. The whole situation. And the prayer that she prayed whilst there prostrate is recorded for us. Claire said, Behold, my Lord, is it possible that you would deliver into the hands of pagans your defenseless slaves, whom I have taught out of love for you? I pray, Lord, protect, protect these your servants, whom I cannot save by myself. And we hear that from the Eucharist was heard a voice, I will always protect you. And so then Claire responded, My Lord, if it is your wish, protect also this city, which is sustained by your love. And once again, whilst Claire was prostrate before the Eucharist, the voice was heard, This town will undergo many trials, but it will be defended by my protection. And when Claire heard those words, she rose, she was crying, and she turned to her sisters and she said, I assure you, daughters, you will suffer no evil. Only have faith in Christ. The whole town and all her sisters got to witness that prayer. And miraculously, the convent and the entire city was saved. From this great event, the invaders turned straight around, straight around and fled. And as Claire's intercession, trusting in Christ present in the Eucharist, in his power and his protection, that won that victory. And hence we have that image, the traditional image of St. Clair holding up the Eucharist for our adoration. Speaking about Claire and watching TV in her room, I mentioned that story watching Mass, sorry, on TV in her room, I mentioned that story not to encourage us or anybody to remain comfortable watching Mass from home or to promote in no way the experience of Claire as the normal and the acceptable way of taking part in the Eucharist. But I put that story and the story of the town of Assisi before us for us to really reflect on that fact, 
why the Holy Spirit granted her that experience. He did it because of the deep, passionate desire in her heart to be united with Christ in the Eucharist. And so in asking that question, for us to reflect on ourselves in the last couple of years and to ask ourselves, why did we watch Mass live stream? To ask ourselves that. There may be many different answers. They may surprise us. It may be confronting to ask. The reason might not come straight away. But to ask ourselves why week after week did we switch on the TV or the internet and watch mass live streamed? What was the reason? What was the desire? What was the intention aflame in our hearts when we did that? We've lived through an incredibly historic time. Okay, people haven't had access to the sacraments all through history, but more in little local areas, perhaps through persecution or through other people who went to war or different things. But never, never in the church's history has there been such a long and universal distance and separation from the sacraments. Never before. It's an incredible crisis we've been through. Such a shake-up. And the fact is that we've been put to the test. As disciples of Christ, we've been through this crisis, and it's been crunch time. And as I said before, crisis brings forth the truth. And so we need to stop coming out, please God, out of this crunch time. We need to stop and think deeply about What truth has been revealed to us? Particularly, what truth about our own Eucharistic faith and the Eucharistic faith of our communities and the church as a whole has been revealed? As a priest, I've witnessed all sorts of different reactions in this crisis time. All sorts. Some disappointing, some confusing, some incredibly encouraging. All different ones. I've had weekly mass goers for decades declare that the live stream is so convenient and they really got used to it that they'll really stay there on the live stream. It just works better for, better for them. And perhaps they'll come to mass every now and then. That's one of the disappointing reactions. Some encouraging reactions at our parish, and I heard many stories at different places of when mass was going on inside, people coming to the church and participating outside legally and kneeling, kneeling at the doors, just yearning to be there, waiting for priests to come out with the Eucharist and to distribute Holy Communion. Or when there was times where the numbers were limited and in some places we had to book for mass, people missing out in one places and taking their families and hopping from church to church, just trying on a Sunday to get in somewhere. Just get in somewhere. These incredible stories of faith. I had many people speak to me with unable to quite put the words on it, and explain themselves and articulate themselves uh, as best they, as they wanted to. But they just said, Father, the live stream just isn't the same. And I would almost shout in joy in response to them. Thank God you realize that it isn't the same. It's, no, it's nowhere near the same. It helped us in a time, but it isn't the same. There were many people, as Father Greg mentioned in the intro, that Really, this was a time of questioning, and I thought, well, why why do I go to Mass? Why am I coming? My life seems the same, not going, and they're in no rush to come back. And then there's others who would uh, watch the live stream, fast forward to the uh, homily, and then switch it off after the homily, just coming for a bit of teaching. But all different reactions, all different reactions. As I said, some really encouraging, some quite disappointing. 
And I'm sure you've heard many different reactions, witnessed many different reactions. And perhaps within your own heart, you've reassessed and questioned and struggled with some of these things throughout this difficult time as well. That's okay. That's okay. They're struggles of faith. But I think what all these different reactions, what they all blow out of the water, is perhaps a backward and too basic and simplistic way of how we've measured people's faith in the past. How we've measured people's closeness to Christ and the sacraments. I think all of these different reactions blows this old way out of the water. I've become aware of this old way, I think, and I'm pretty sure I might be oversimplifying it, but really we saw two categories of people There were people who come to Mass and therefore they believe in the Eucharist and everything that goes on at Mass. And there's people that don't come to Mass and for some reason they don't. And flowing on from splitting everyone into those very simple two groups, if you did anything that resulted in someone not coming to Mass, it was automatically bad, no matter what it was. And if you did absolutely anything that resulted in someone coming to Mass, it was automatically good. Doesn't matter what it was. And really, I think this oversimplification was people sitting in pews equaled people close to Christ in the Eucharist. But the crisis has shown us that's simply not true. And perhaps the crisis has revealed those difficult questions for us. Now, the Eucharist is the source and summit of Christian life. And we would hope that all of our efforts were leading and resulting in more people being at Mass and participating at the table of the Lord. But it's a marathon and not a sprint. But we can see from all those different responses of faithfulness throughout the crisis that people's faith is a lot more complex, much deeper, and a little more difficult to understand than simply whether they're sitting in a church or not. And we need to get down to that level if we want to have a deep reverence, deep relationship, and deep faith with Christ in the Eucharist. Moving forward, I think we can focus on two real things, two real important things that can help us with a deep Eucharistic revival in our parishes, in our families, and in the church as a whole. I think two areas of focus that many mistakes about the Eucharist have been spread about. The the two of these things are reconnecting the Eucharist with holiness and reconnecting the Eucharist with love. The first, it's our mission really to reconnect the Eucharist with holiness. And to display this point, we're going to speak about a very young blessed. Thanks, Father Greg. This guy. Blessed Carlo Acutis. So Blessed Carlo was born in May 1991. So he, if he was alive today, he would have only been a year older than me, which always makes me feel quite ashamed because I see the levels of sanctity that he reached and um, I see I'm very far off him, but he, he did very well. Uh, Blessed Carlo, Carlo Acutis, born in London to Italian parents and at a very young age moved back to Italy. Carlo was born in a non-practicing family. His father virtually had no faith. His mum said she went to Mass three times at her communion, at her confirmation and at her wedding. Not a very unusual family in the Catholic world today a non-practicing family, her parents have fallen away. And Carlo, a very normal kid. Thanks, Father Greg. We've got, I just share some very real photos because we don't often have these very real photos of saints. 
Uh, we often have paintings and things. But you can see Carlo is a baby and a toddler. And then the next, Father Greg. Fa Carlo is a very normal kid. Owned his own PlayStation and had his own games. Had a deep love for animals. Many, many pets. You can see him with one of his dogs. He had four dogs, two cats. And his mum said he went through many goldfish uh, on a rotation basis, as most kids do with goldfish. Uh, but a deep love uh, for animals. A very ordinary kid of the 90s. Carlo reached the heights and maturity of sanctity that most of us would dream of reaching at a very young age. I mentioned he had a PlayStation. That was his penance, one of his penances. He used to limit his hours because he knew how much danger the technology was to him. And he used to offer up penance as a young boy, just taking this upon himself, limiting the hours he used to play the PlayStation. Chocolate was his other favorite penance, knowing its dangers. He had a deep love for the poor. A deep love for the poor. His mum would constantly buy him shoes and he was only ever comfortable with having one pair. And as soon as his mum would buy him a, another, a second pair, he would take them straight away and give them to someone who was poor. And his mum used to get upset, just kept buying him shoes and buying him shoes and buying, and he'd take the shoes and give them away, take the shoes and give them away. And he knew, I only need one pair of shoes. Living this simplicity, this poverty, this trust in the Lord, that he didn't need all of these things his mum was giving him. He shone at school. Remember, he's a young boy, primary school kid. He shone at school. He had a particular love and felt a particular obligation to protect many of the disabled kids at school who were often bullied. He would seek out children of broken homes and difficult family lives and make sure he spent time with them at school, that they would have a great day if they weren't having the best time at school. And when he could, he would invite them over to home to make sure they had a great time at his place. Knowing that for many people, family life is difficult. A young kid living a very deep and beautiful love. And some of the quotes we have from this young boy are incredible, showing that maturity and that heights of his sanctity. Father Greg, thank you. Oh, that's him with his soccer team. And then uh, if we keep going, Father Greg, there we go. Oh, sorry, Father, we'll move back. I've jumped ahead. Yeah, that's good. He said, our home is not the finite, but the infinite. We are always expected in heaven. And he said from a very young age, to always be close to Jesus. That is my life plan. Carlo died at the age of 15 in 2006. And he died of leukemia and he offered his sufferings and his death for the intentions of the Holy Father, Pope Benedict, and for the entire church, knowing that his suffering could contribute to the good of the church and the good of others. A young boy knowing that and doing it. When he was dying, he said, I'm happy to die because I have lived my life without wasting a minute on things that don't please God. What a beautiful thing to be able to say as we approach our maker. Signs of deep holiness. How did such a young kid from a non-practicing family in a very secular world live a beautiful, holy, short life like this? The answer's in that picture. It was the Eucharist. That's Carlo on the day of his first Holy Communion, age seven. He had a great catechist who taught him about the Eucharist because he wasn't getting that education from home. 
and he instantly fell in love and had a deep faith in the Eucharist. And from that day, age seven, to the day he died in 2006, age 15, he never missed daily mass. Not once. A seven-year-old in a non-practicing family. He used to walk himself to mass every day. Knowing there he would meet Christ. Knowing there he would find salvation and strength and grace. What incredible faith. You see the fruit of his life. You see his amazing holiness. And that's the answer. You see a saint. You see a great disciple of Christ. The Eucharist is the answer. That he was close to Christ in the Eucharist. Father Greg, if we move forward, this was another of his quotes. Jesus is my great friend and the Eucharist is my highway to heaven. So simple. He just knew it. And the next one, Father. If we get in front of the sun, we get suntans. But when we get in front of Jesus in the Eucharist, we become saints. That's it. Holiness is found in the Eucharist. Being great disciples, being great saints of the Lord is found in the Eucharist. And that has been forgotten. In many ways we've been told, yes, we can be followers of Christ, but we don't have to come to Mass. Or we can find Christ in other places and we can do other things. And yes, we can, but this is where it's at. This is where all the spiritual treasures of the church are. This is where Christ himself is. And he is the source of our holiness. And Carlo shows us that in such simplicity and such beauty. He shows us that is, it's just incredible. We can read and read and read about the Eucharist, but to see his faith in Christ's presence and see that bear fruit in his life is just so clear and beautiful and simple. His mum had a massive conversion. <laughs> he started to drag her along to Mass, a little boy. How beautiful that his mum fell in love with the Eucharist, watching him do that. And Carlo was actually a computer whiz, all self-taught. A computer whiz of the 90s and the early 2000s. He probably doesn't have much on the computer whiz kids of today. But he was, he was somewhat of a genius. Even at a very young age, big corporations were already looking to set him up for a career in the computer industry with his software. And part of that was he wanted the whole world to share his love of the Eucharist. To know that Christ was present there that Christ chose to give us his sacrament to remain with us forever and to give us everything we need. So Carlo said, how do I tell the world about this? I'll create my own website. And thanks, Father Greg. He created a website cataloging every Eucharistic miracle ever recorded, all on one website. Thanks, Father. You can see his, his website is a little bit early 2000s. We've probably moved on from this technology, but you can still look up the website. It's still active and live. And he goes through every Eucharistic miracle and he wanted people to have encounters and read about these things so that they would know what the Eucharist was, that it was truly Christ present here with us. And he, he did all sorts of research, took photos, put together all these different things collated them all in his spare time just so everybody would know know the gift and the treasure found in the Eucharist know Christ found there what an example if we want to speak about how holiness and the Eucharist go together what an example in blessed Carlo Acutis the second that's probably been split up. And that's the Eucharist and love. As more and more people have moved away from Mass, but still claim to be Christian or Catholic, as more and more people aren't part of Christian communities, but claim to be followers of God, the idea has spread 
that, well, I don't need to come to Mass. I don't need the sacraments to love. I can find other ways to love God and I can experience God's love in other ways. And yes, once again, yes, God's love is not only found in the Eucharist. However, it is indispensable. And it is the source and summit of all of our experiences of God's love. And it's the way Christ has asked us to experience his love. Archbishop Fulton Sheen said, the greatest love story ever told is contained in a tiny white host. The greatest love story ever told is contained in a tiny white host. And there's three chapters to this love story. The first chapter is presence. The second chapter is sacrifice, and the third chapter is communion of the greatest love story ever told. The first chapter, presence. Christ loved us so much that he chose to become one of us. He chose to be our brother, to take on a human nature and to be close to us. It's the mystery of the incarnation. That Christ, in his love, wished to be present with us and wished to share everything with us and to be close to us in his humanity. And that love was so great and so deep that it spurred him on to the second chapter, which was the chapter of sacrifice. That that love reached its fullness on the cross That not only did he want to share our joys and our hopes and our dreams, all the good things with us, but he wanted to share our sufferings. He wanted to share the consequences of our failings. He wanted to share our wounds and our struggles. And so he gives himself up in love on the cross. Reach that love that presence reaches its fullness and fulfillment and perfection in dying for us. No greater love have this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And why does he do that? He does that for chapter 3, for communion, that we may be joined with him for eternity. That there isn't, because he has gone to the cross, there isn't a human experience, a human weakness that we cannot find communion with him. And that he has washed us of our sins, gained salvation for the whole world, for each and every single one of us through his loving sacrifice on the cross in order for us to live forever with him in divine life in heaven. The three great chapters, the presence of the incarnation, the sacrifice of Calvary, and the communion of heaven. The three chapters of the greatest love story ever told. And that greatest love story with all three chapters is contained in a tiny white host. Christ in the Eucharist is present with us right now in every church in the world Christ is not a subject of our imagination Christ is not in some far off place Christ is truly here really and wholly here body blood soul and divinity and when we come to mass We come to Calvary. We come to that sacrifice where Christ present pours himself out in love. When we sit here, when we kneel before the altar, when we take part in mass, we are at Calvary. We are there with our lady and St. John and those faithful disciples who stuck close to the cross. 
there experiencing all the fruits of the sacrifice. And then when we receive that host, we have the most beautiful holy communion with our Lord. A foretaste of that unity that we are going to have with him in eternity in heaven. The greatest love story ever told, split up into three chapters, present here on this altar. Now, if that's the truth of the Eucharist, I want that love. <laughs> that's the greatness, the greatest of loves. We pray We pray that the lives of St. Clair, Blessed Carlo, all the saints who teach us the truth about the Eucharist, who teach us the treasures, the power and the love all in the Eucharist, teach us Christ present in the Eucharist and everything it gives us. We pray that that may inspire us to be ever more devoted, ever closer and more faithful to the Eucharist. And for us, like Blessed Carlo, to be set on fire, to be filled with a holiness and a love in the Eucharist, that we begin to bring others with us. That people see holiness in us, people see love, and they ask where that is, and we say it's at Mass. It's in the Eucharist. We pray that this mystery may be so clear in our lives and in our parish, as it was in the lives of Carlo and Claire, so that we may bring many souls to Christ. Thanks for listening. Father, thank, thank you for that marvelous talk. Uh, it was profoundly moving. And I was thinking, uh, I've spent a few days um, lecturing. But it was so wonderful to have my own soul nourished. It was exactly what I needed to hear. So um, thank you so much. And I was thinking also that that's exactly the talk <laughs> that our families in school need to hear, particularly for First Communion. So maybe we can talk about incorporating this into our sacramental program. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Father Romy? Don't make a tough bet. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, one obviously, the the story of Carlo's life is all God's doing, and so all of these stories and all of these things are grace. They're free, unmerited gift. But we we cooperate. And looking at the story of Carlo's life, it's really the gift of a great catechist that uh, God arranged. Okay, God obviously gave him a special grace and a special love and a receptivity, but there was also the faithfulness of his catechist and his school teachers who taught him, and those things together made the, made the young blessed that we have before us. And so, you know, how many kids those catechists or those school teachers in his town would have taught, and they didn't see many of these things. And perhaps they would have been you know, times of great doubt and trouble for them, questioning, well, why am I doing this? And the more and more kids we teach, the more and more are moving away. And then God shocks them and surprises them with, with a kid like Carlo. And those kids are out there. Those kids are out there. So for whatever role we have in the church, whether it's catechists or parents or teachers or helping in the sacramental program or whatever we do, 
to know that our faithfulness is going to be instrumental in other people's lives, whether we see it or not. Uh, and God will use our faithfulness in, in ways we, we don't plan and perhaps we'll only know in hindsight. Um, so, yeah, looking at Carlo's life, I really see the faithfulness of those who influenced him uh, to be so instrumental. Yeah. Um, I just want to share for me, each time I come to church, and why I'm addicted to coming to church is, I'm always amazed to the process of the Mass, that I'll have something happen during the week, and I can't get the answer, no matter how much I think about it in my mind. And it might be two words in a Gospel reading, it might be the theme of the homily, and through the process of the Mass, I get the answer that I've been searching for, and that happens to me every Sunday that I come to church. So I can't go without coming to church because I wouldn't have the answers or the healing that I go through while I'm at church. But my question is, I always have the body of Christ, not the blood of Christ. So am I getting half the blessing each time I come to church? No, no, you're not. Uh... Uh, the church is clearly taught that each Eucharistic species, the body and the blood, contain Christ entire and whole. Uh, so you're not, you're not missing out on any graces or any part of Christ if you, if you don't receive uh, from the chalice. Uh, so yeah, uh, each species contains him entire and whole. Yeah. Father, this is more a statement than a question, but I do believe that West Carlo was buried in St. Francis Basilica uh, in Assisi, and St. Catherine of St. Clear was a very good friend of St. Francis as well. That's right, yeah. What, what an amazing joining yeah. of two great saints. Yeah, so it, it is beautiful. Carlo had a deep devotion to St. Francis, and he asked his parents to, be bury, to bury him uh, in Assisi. Uh, he initially wasn't, then they moved him to Assisi. And then when he was beatified, he was moved not to the Basilica of St. Francis, but to the Cathedral of Assisi. So there's the Basilica where Francis is buried and the Cathedral of Assisi. His body is uh, in, in the, uh, the Cathedral of Assisi, actually the same church where St. Francis was baptised. And um, there, his, his custody is, is glass, and so he's dressed in an Adidas jumper, I think, and Nike tops. Very, very modern saint. <laughs> a typical young person. So, yeah, it's a beautiful connection. And where are we going? Thanks, Father. And I heard it described from the, described by an Irish priest that just when you were talking about uh, Carlos's uh, down re receiving of the Eucharist. And uh, this Irish priest described the kids when they received the Eucharist as almost like a parting ceremony. That up to that point in their young lives, they are coached and, uh, about receiving the Eucharist. And for once they receive the Eucharist, we don't see them back in church again. And unfortunately, uh, that's so often the case. And, and I would like to know about what, what's the after, so almost like the aftercare that you that we put into, say, the schooling, so to continue to encourage kids. Because once they once they come here, and it's as much to do with the parents as well as the kids, or vice versa, and how do we encourage them? keep coming back and to mm. take an active part and, and especially between the ages of first Holy communion up to that point of, uh, of confirmation beyond that really on the one two feet but that critical stage in between say seven and eleven and twelve was the most delicate age that they need to be continually encouraged to come here we don't really see a lot of you know the participation that's all Hmm. Yeah, if I could answer that question, I'd solve a lot of problems. But uh, it, look, a big, a big key part of it is parents. And uh, 
you know, the, the conversion and the renewal and the, the spiritual awakening of parents uh, is, is so fundamental. And if that can occur, then that will flow on into good, good faithful children. Um, so that's, that's a big part of it. Look, there, there may be some parents who uh, are, are going through the motions and faith is a bit of a co-curricular activity. Um, at, that's part of the school. But I'm sure there are, I'm sure there are a substantial number of parents who want their children to be holy and want their children to experience God's love. I'm sure there are. And part of, part of that big group, I think, they would have the perception that, well, my children can find holiness somewhere else. They may find it at Mass, but they could find it somewhere else. They could find closeness to Christ and living a good, fulfilled and righteous life somewhere else. And they could find the experience of God's love somewhere else as well. But the saints and the church and Christ himself teaches us the principal way to have that holiness and that love is in the Eucharist and in the sacraments. So perhaps bridging that gap for parents of knowing their desire for their children and saying, well, well, look at the world. Are they really experiencing those things in the places where you think they will get them? And, and, and what about here? Do you know the riches and the treasures here at the altar? Um, and the other thing is, um, you know, we, we, pray, we pray how we believe. And so uh, many kids perhaps don't have experiences of reverence for the Eucharist and, and continual, uh, you know, uh, deep faith and acting and praying in a way where Christ is present. A big, a big part, you know, is taking kids to adoration, primary school kids to adoration. Uh, and, and getting them used to praying before the Blessed Sacrament, I think is so important. Uh, deepening their personal prayer, but also deepening their faith in Christ's presence in the Eucharist. Adoration is a big thing. And I never experienced adoration at school, ever. Uh, never once. But uh, in, in my short years, and I please God hope here, uh, to, I've, I've been taking the primary school kids to adoration and uh, you know, increasing that reverence and, and that knowledge and faith in Christ's presence there in the Eucharist. And that begins to bear fruit in kids making a visit to the church because uh, they know Christ is present here and, and they know that they can have a little short form of adoration as they, as they walk in compared to the longer time of adoration they have with their class. Yeah, but it's, it's all part of the renewal. It's all, it's all part of the renewal. Yeah. Thank you, Father. My question is a bit more of a practical or worldview question. Um, you mentioned the pandemic, you mentioned how um, right across the world we have those challenges, and you mentioned some of the pros and, and not so pros, I guess, um, in terms of live stream masses. Um, do you see that this? period of time across the church can be a renewal or a positive way for us to look at and say this is my faith. Now the reason I'm asking you this is because there are a good, good uh, percentage of people who fervently believe, I know mean, this doesn't sound like it's one thing to go another, about anti-vaccine and the, uh, one particular thing and they are right in their belief. They put themselves in danger. I'm not saying I agree with it, but I'm saying, do you think that we have a way of, of that in terms of faith and renewing ourselves in the church? So you, I, it, think, I think it was sent to us. So what, uh, what you're saying is, um, uh, can we match the zeal of yeah. other people for yes. their particular causes uh, of of whatever causes people have, uh, whether it's football or vaccines or politics or all the different things people are zealous about, can we have that same zeal for the faith? Yes, definitely. <laughs> I, I think that's one of the big things we've been lacking. Uh, what can we do? Well, I, I think inviting people to Mass, speaking to people about Mass, but also 
I think when we see the Eucharist and love divided in conversation and the Eucharist and holiness divided in conversation and in teaching, to, to honestly and charitably call that out. And to say, well, no, Christ's asked us to principally experience his love in the Mass. And say, no, I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I can't be holy without the Eucharist. And Christ has told us none of us can be holy without the Eucharist. You know, and, and those, those opportunities where we see that in conversation or in teaching or in different ways of acting, where those things are being separated... To, to have the courage and the zeal to say, well, no, they go together and Christ told us so. Uh, that, that's, that's very important. Yeah. I think this is a deep time of renewal. You know, uh, we, we couldn't control the pandemic happening, but I think we have a much more humble and honest view of the true state of affairs as they really are. And, uh, you know... Like, like what Father Greg said, there's those surveys about how many actual ca practicing Catholics believe then in the real presence. And, and perhaps also, you know, more and more young people now, cultural Catholicism is dying. They, they won't write that they're Catholic on the census if they go to Mass once a year. Well, is that, is that, big, is that a big issue? That's it's, it's actually telling us the truth more honestly than, you know, I tick Catholic if I'm a cultural Catholic. You know, it's, it's giving us a much clearer picture of, of the battleground and, and our missionary territory. And so I think that's accelerating now and, and things are going to become a lot more clear yeah, over, over the next period. Yeah. A wonderful talk. Uh, it was very moving, very inspiring. And uh, it was exactly what my soul needed to hear, so I'm very grateful. <laughs> uh, the uh, last uh, Lincoln lecture is next week, and uh, I'm speaking on a, a not so inspiring and moving topic. Uh, it is called uh, From Good Friday to Easter Sunday What Catholics Believe Happens, What Catholics Believe About Life After Death. Um, so, rather a more good topic, you know, I think if, uh, if only 30% of American Catholics understand the Eucharist, I think even less know or understand what Catholics actually believe about life after death. So uh, you're very welcome to attend uh, that final talk. It certainly won't be the last talk. Um, I'm just thinking about what sort of talks we'll put on, but I'm very interested in putting on um, an apologetical series and philosophy talks. Uh, the Archdiocese is going to come out here in May and uh, to record a couple of talks that are going to go out to lots and lots of different parishes. So we're just trying to work out the topics for that. Um, so I'd be very, always very interested your feedback and your suggestions about what you think people need to hear, the kind of formation people want. Let's just finish with Hail Mary. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and the hour of our death. Amen. And with the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, without the Holy Spirit, Thank you so much for coming and see you next week. God bless.